Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Tara Karen. I'm a family doctor at St. Michael's Hospital and the vice chair for quality and innovation at the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. I'm really pleased to welcome you to our COVID-19 community of practice for Ontario family physicians. I'll be your moderator this morning and um, really pleased that our department can co-organize these sessions with the Ontario College of Family Physicians. And to that effect, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Maga, the president of COCFP. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, we are happy to be hosting today along uh, with the Department of Community and Family Medicine. We've got a great um, session today for you. So very excited about that. Uh, these are the speakers for today and they will have a chance to uh, introduce themselves later. Um, and there's a note there about main pro credits. Next slide. Um, so the land acknowledgement, we'll start with that. We acknowledge that the lands on which we are hosting this meeting include the traditional territories of many nations. The OCFP and DFCM recognize the many injustices experienced by the Indigenous peoples of what we now call Canada continue to affect their health and well-being. The OCFP and DFCM respect that Indigenous people have rich cultural and traditional practices that have been known to improve health outcomes. I invite all of us to reflect on the territories you are calling in from as we commit ourselves to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship, um, and contributing to reconciliation. So it's hard to believe that this session is um, our last before we head into 2021. Um, and of course, with the new year brings new hope and new resolutions. Um, and if you are gonna think about a resolution um, related to um, you know, uh, addressing the past injustices done to Indigenous people, uh, if you haven't done so already, I'd urge you to do the Ontario Indigenous Cultural Safety Program training. And we'll put the link out in the chat. Um, I've done it myself. And uh, you know, I, I found it a very helpful way to unlearn and learn um, about uh, the history of Indigenous people and the continued struggles. Next slide. So, um, you know, we pulled together this community of practice, understanding that there's a, we're working and living in a time with a, immense uncertainty. I mean, we needed to have a place to come together as family doctors um, where we could share and learn from each other. We recognized that we didn't always have all the answers, um, but that we'd come together and share and learn with the knowledge that we had. And I say that today because it's particularly apt. Um, we're going to be talking about the COVID vaccine and um, you know, that is the great hope for 2021. At the same time, there is a lot that is unknown. And so we're gonna do our best to um, put out there the things that we do know um, and be clear about some of the things we don't know. Next, um, next slide. I wanted to just uh, thank our planning committee um, for their uh, work on selecting the speakers. The speakers are chosen by the planning committee um, and uh, we, it is an accredited session. You'll be receiving those uh, credits uh, in about a week or two uh, after the session. Next slide. So I am delighted that we've got a great panel today, um, family physicians, public health, um, working together during COVID-19. Next slide. Um, we've also got some guests um, that are with us on a routine basis. Next slide. I am I'm going to turn it over to them um, one at a time to introduce themselves and speak to their conflicts of interest. So, Jeff Kwong, do you want to go first? Sure. Thank you, Tara. Uh, so, my name is Jeff Kwong. I'm a family physician at Toronto Western uh, Family Health Team. I'm also a senior scientist at ICS, a scientist at Public Health Ontario, uh, also affiliated with the University of Toronto. Um, so my conflicts of interest are that I get um, research support uh, grants from uh, CIHR, um, Health Canada, and USCDC, and I uh, receive um, an honoraria for speaking uh, from the OCFP. Um, yep, that's, so those are my affiliations. So I'm an epidemiologist uh, and public health physician by training, and I practice one day a week with family medicine. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I'm going to turn it over to you, Trevor. Hi, I'm uh, Trevor Arneson. I'm the Associate Medical Officer of Health at uh, Ottawa Public Health. I'm a public health physician and I'm also a part-time uh, family physician here in Ottawa. Uh, I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest uh, to declare for this session. Lee? Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Lee Donahue. I'm a family physician in Orleans. Uh, I'm not receiving any financial sponsorship from the Ontario Medical Association, but I 
did want to declare that I do serve as a board director there. And otherwise, I have no other uh, conflicts of interest or honor area to declare. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Next slide. Liz? Hi, I'm uh, Liz Maga, family doctor in Ottawa, and I'm also the president of the Ontario College of Family Physicians. Um, and in addition, I'm the assistant dean wellness at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. David? Hi, I'm David Kaplan. I'm the chief of clinical quality at Ontario Health, a family physician here in Toronto. And um, no conflicts uh, or relationships with financial sponsors, but I do receive an honoraria from the Ontario College of Family Physicians, and uh, I'm an employee, obviously, at Ontario Health. Um, and I'm Tara Kieran. Uh, I am a researcher um, as well as a family doctor, and so do have a number of grants and uh, salary support uh, that, that I've listed. Um, the only one from a commercial company is from Gilead Sciences for a, a project to cure hep C. Um, next slide. So, of course, uh, what makes our session great also is all of you, and we have uh, great attendance from the GTA as well as many people from outside the GTA, and you can see there from London to Kenora, Bracebridge to Owen Sound. Next slide. Um, I just wanted to go over how you can participate. Um, so. Uh, there's two key participation tools. One is the Q&A. So if you have a question, um, we highly recommend that you put the question into the Q&A box. Um, our panelists will answer some of those questions live, um, and some of the questions they'll answer just typewritten in the Q&A box, and you can go to the Answered tab to see their answers. Um, if you have yourself a link that you wanted to share or a comment you wanted to make, um, then put those in the chat. Uh, and, and that's a lovely way for, I guess, all, for all of us to learn from each other. If it is a question, though, um, please do put it in the Q&A. Uh, it helps us to keep track of things as the chat gets crazy. Next slide. Um, so without further, further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Jeff Kwong. Um, so Jeff, I mean, it's all anyone can talk about. It's all, all that there is, I think, in the media is the COVID vaccine. Um, I think so much of, so many of us last, last session we had, we talked about COVID fatigue, we're all tired and we're looking for something to, to, to put our hopes to. And um, there's still though a lot of questions out there. Uh, and I wonder Jeff, you know, we received a lot of questions from audience members about the vaccine, um, you know, what it does, the safety and, and uh, what we can expect. And I wonder if you could um, tell us a little bit about, uh, about all of that based on what you know, the information available. Yeah, thanks, Tara. So yeah, I mean, it's uh, an extremely uh, dynamic situation, uh, new information coming out like every day. Um, so just take anything I say with a grain of salt, I'll try to share, you know, whatever I know, um, but there's just so much that uh, nobody knows at this point. And definitely, I don't know, I don't have a lot of answers to a lot of the questions that were posed um, by the audience today. Um, that said, maybe, Brian, I'll ask you to turn to the, the next slide, please, so people can read this in case they haven't seen it. Um, this is the uh, abstract of the paper that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine um, earlier this week, uh, talking about the Pfizer vaccine. So these are the results, uh, the safety and efficacy results from the, uh, of the Pfizer vaccine. So this is a collaboration between Pfizer and this German company called BioNTech. Um, so there are, you know, four candidate vaccines that we've probably heard the most about. So there's a Pfizer product uh, and the Moderna product, and both of those are mRNA vaccines. So that's messenger RNA, um, and that's a, a new technology where um, the vaccine is basically a piece of mRNA that, um, you know, gets taken up by our cells, and then, uh, you know, we our cells actually. Um, you know, use the mRNA and then encode the protein. So we encode the spike protein uh, and we produce the spike protein and that's what stimulates the immune response. So this is a novel uh, way of, of making vaccines and uh, quite exciting that, uh, we, you know, we're getting such good results uh, with, uh, we, you know, we've all seen in the news releases, you know, both of these uh, products seem to have like 95% uh, efficacy in the, in the phase three trials. The other two are the AstraZeneca uh, collaboration with Oxford University 
uh, and then the Johnson & Johnson products. And so those products are using um, chimpanzee adenovirus as a vector. So they, they take an adenovirus, uh, vax, uh, va adenovirus and they've um, spliced in um, some RNA from the, um, uh, some genetic material from the uh, from, from coronavirus. And then um, they're using that as a vector to deliver um, the the, uh, the genetic uh, the uh, genetic product of the of the COVID vaccine uh, virus uh, to cells, and so just this morning I, I saw you know in the Lancet uh, you know uh, table of contents they re um, published uh, the AstraZeneca results uh, from their phase three trials, and um, so they're showing maybe a bit lo lower efficacy. Maybe uh, you know there was like if you had two standard doses and it was sixty percent, but then if you got like a, a half dose and then the standard dose, it was like 90%. So overall, they said it was about 70% efficacy. Um, so, I mean, I guess we'll just see, you know, what happens as it goes through the regulatory process and all that sort of thing, what ends up being uh, recommended. Um, so, yeah, so you can see in this, you know, uh, abstract, you know, they talk about the efficacy results. Um, they also talk about the safety, uh, which you can't see here, but, um, you know, the safety, you know, so far what we've heard for the Pfizer and Moderna, they're, they're, they're safe vaccines, give, take into consideration that they've only been given, you know, the trials had, you know, the Pfizer trial had, you know, about 44,000, which means that only 22,000 people uh, would have received the vaccine and 22,000 would have received the placebo. Uh, the main side effects are uh, pain at the injection site, um, a fatigue and headache. Um, and so those are three are, you know, the most prominent ones. Um, but you may have also read in the news that there were four cases of Bell's palsy um, in the intervention arm. Uh, so out of like the 22,000 people who were vaccinated, uh, there were four cases of Bell's palsy. Um, the things to keep in mind are, you know, and, and there's zero in the, um, in the control arm. So we'll have to keep an eye on that to see if that's, you know, really an association or if there's just chance that they had uh, four cases of Bell's palsy. Um, and so I think the thing to keep in mind is that this is a really short um, amount of follow-up time. Um, you know, I think they only follow them up for a, a few months after receiving the vaccine. Um, the one thing I forgot to mention is that the two uh, mRNA products requires two doses uh, spaced 21 days apart. Um, but the data from this, uh, you know, I highly encourage you to take a look through this paper if, if you have a chance. Uh, there's a figure in there showing, you know, the the, the Kaplan-Meier curve, so like the uh, survival curve of the, um, you know, of the people who received, you know, the the dose um, of like the two arms, and you can see after the first dose, there's actually, you know, pretty good protection, uh, maybe as much as 90% protection already. So, so we'll see if the, you know, right now the in the monograph, you know, the the uh, recommendation is to receive two doses, but uh, we may see guidance. Uh, change and maybe say, you know, one dose may be enough just, you know, just so that we can vaccinate double the number of people instead of, you know, instead of being able to vaccinate, let's say 50,000 people at one time, we can vaccinate 100,000 people right away. Um, you know, so we'll see how that goes. So the next thing I want to talk about is the, uh, so these are the four products. There's, you know, lots more information to come. They're going through um, regulatory review. So Pfizer's already received the approval from Health Canada. I'm sure uh, Moderna will be getting approval shortly. Um, and then, you know, the AstraZeneca, et cetera, you know, we'll see when those get approved. Um, so I'm gonna talk next about the prioritization that is recommended by NASPI or the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. So they've been re uh, released some guidance in November and then they released more guidance, um, I think uh, last week or maybe earlier this week, um, where, you know, for stage one, uh, they recommended that it should go to uh, residents and staff of long-term care homes and retirement homes. So basically anywhere where there's, you know, congregate living settings where, where they're caring for um, seniors. Um, a second group are uh, healthcare workers. So, to, you know, so they're looking after because, you know, as all of us know, we look after, um, you know, sick and vulnerable patients. And also we need, we're needed to keep the health system going. Uh, a third group are adults uh, age 80 or over, um, and then, you know, moving down to 75 and older and then 70 or, and older. Um, and then lastly, uh, they also recommended adults living in Indigenous communities uh, because it may be hard for them to have access to health services. 
Uh, so that's stage one is what they recommend. Uh, and then stage two, there's a whole other list, like including essential workers um, and, you know, a few other groups. So, so we'll see how it goes. I think it's going to, um, you know, take time. And maybe, Brian, if you can go to the next slide. So you can see uh, this was in the Globe and Mail yesterday or maybe the day before um, where they showed uh, the distribution, uh, like the anticipated schedule of when we'll be getting uh, vaccines and how many doses by how uh, by what time period. So, you know, we'll see if this plays out. Um, you know, it's, I mean, I think things are just changing, like, you know, week by week in terms of, you know, what's happening here. You know, at first they're saying, oh, we'll be lucky to have it in the first quarter of 2021, so January to March. And then now all of a sudden now they're saying, oh, we're going to get some in December. And like, oh, we're, we're getting it on Monday and we're going to start vaccinating on Tuesday. So I think, um, the, you know, I think it's a good thing that we're getting these doses earlier than expected. It seems like, um, you know, I think we, I, I feel it's like the Canadian government has under promised and over delivered versus the US government where they seem to have over promised and under delivered uh, where they're, you know, first it was supposed to be in November and now they're saying now they're not going to start vaccinating the US till later in December or even January. Um, but so anyway, the bottom line here is that, you know, everyone on, on, on this call as healthcare workers, you will likely be vaccinated um, before March um, if, you know, if you're willing to get the vaccine. Um, and so, you know, there will be doses for all of us, um, you know, in, by, you know, the end of the first quarter of 2021. And then hopefully uh, we'll be able to vaccinate, um, you know, the, the general public, you know, by the spring or the summer. So hopefully all of our family members, uh, everyone else we know will also be vaccinated uh, by, you know, hopefully September of 2021. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and in terms of the details of how it's being distributed, I mean, there's not a lot out there. Uh, right now in, in Ontario, uh, you know, we, we can see in the news that there are 6,000 doses uh, coming by Monday, and they're going to be starting to vaccinate um, in Toronto and Ottawa, um, you know, at, uh, at UHN and at, I think, the Ottawa Hospital uh, on Tuesday. And they're saying that they're not, you know, once they get to the hospitals, they're not going to be shipped elsewhere. So people have to go to those hospitals to get vaccinated. Um, I'm not sure if that has to do with the storage issues. So the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored in freezers that are at minus 70. Uh, the Moderna has to be stored at minus 20. Um, but I, I have read that, you know, you can keep them at fridge temps for up to five days. Um, so I don't know if it's because they're just worried about cold, cold chains being broken, uh, if they have to, you know, send it the, the, from a hospital to like a long-term care facility, or if they're worried about security or what. Um, but Anyway, the plan is that they're going to keep them at the hospital. So they're starting with those two hospitals, and then they're going to be, uh, I think, like another 23 hospitals that the, the Pfizer products going to be shipped to. And I've just heard that the, they'll use the Moderna product uh, for long-term care residents where they bring them to the long-term care homes. Or another option is they bring the long-term care residents to the hospitals to get vaccinated, although that seems like um, you know, a whole lot of work and maybe not the most efficient way to get these people vaccinated. Um, so we'll see what happens with these Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. We're going to be getting, um, you know, I've heard 100,000 doses of the Pfizer product in December and another like 60 or 80 something thousand of the Moderna product also in December. Um, and then, you know, we'll be getting more of both of those in January, February, March. And who knows when we'll get the AstraZeneca uh, and Johnson & Johnson uh, product. So we'll see. Maybe we'll be reserving those ones for uh, those in the community. So that's basically all I have to say. Um, like I said, um, you know, probably more questions than answers at this point, um, but that's kind of what uh, we do know at this point. So Jeff, on the on, on the on the movement side, it, the on the uh, Pfizer vaccine, um, at the moment, it is the company that has told the country that we're not allowed to move it from where they're distributing it. Uh, Pfizer actually will be distributing the vaccine through their old their own uh, um, logistics mechanism uh, directly to the places, the depots, whatever word you want to use um, that have been identified by the government as uh, those sites for immunization. So until Pfizer tells the government otherwise, um, I think our hands are a bit tied in, in moving the vaccine, even outside. You know, we have a, a long term care home that's maybe half a block away from our hospital we're not allowed to move it out to that long-term care home. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, David. And thanks so much, Jeff, for the, you know, really detailed overview. Um, I think that, you know, 
I certainly found it a helpful um, summary of like what it is that we know and, and unfortunately some of what we don't know. There's some wonderful questions, great questions in the Q&A and I'm just gonna um, maybe ask a couple to you right now. So um, one is, you know, for uh, around, uh, uh, oh, sorry, maybe it disappeared from here. Um, for persons who've recovered from COVID-19, can we advise them to delay vaccination? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I haven't seen um, anything written about that yet. Um, you know, I, we, the, I think the issues are that we don't know how long the immunity lasts from infection. So, you know, if someone's really high risk, um, are they at high risk of getting reinfected as well? You know, and would they benefit from vaccine? I, I mean, I think, um, I'm sure NAFSI has that on the radar and, uh, but I don't, I haven't seen any guidance from them about uh, about that yet. I don't know if any of the other panelists have seen anything. Um, no. Okay. And so another question is from Kimberly Wintermute about um, is there potential for any long-term genetic alterations effects in recipients from mRNA vaccine? Have any geneticists opined on this? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so, you know, we don't have any reverse transcriptases that can incorporate this mRNA into our genetic, uh, you know, so mRNA needs to be converted to DNA and uh, via a, a reverse transcriptase, and we don't have that. So it's actually impossible for this to be incorporated into our uh, genetic, um, you know, our genomes. Um, so there's no concern about that whatsoever. So, you know, our body just sees this mRNA, our cells will just produce the proteins, and, and that's the end of the story for the mRNA. So that's, Great, that's a frequent you. question that I've heard people ask. And uh, yeah, that, that's not a concern uh, hearing from multiple experts. Um, and, and so a, a few more questions. Somebody asked about vaccine in children. And I know, David, you said it's not indicated in children under 16. I don't know if, if you guys want to expand on that. Yeah, I mean, it's just because they haven't done the trials yet. Um, and my understanding is that they're going to be doing trials now or very soon. Um, in children. So then hopefully once they have those results, uh, they will get the indication for vaccinating uh, in children as well. I mean, there's no, I mean, you know, we'll see. We'll see what that shows. Okay. Um, lots of questions. Um, I guess an, another one I'll save one from Brian. Uh, any differences between the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine? Um, how are they different? Yeah. Outside um, of the difference I, in the vaccine handling, I guess is what he was saying. Yeah, I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, yeah, so there's that this aspect of what's, you know, the storage temperature. Um, yeah, I don't know the details enough about each of the vaccines to say, you know, whether the, the liposomal coats are different um, or, or what. Yeah, sorry. No worries. Um, and so uh, you mentioned um, uh, about Bell's palsy um, as uh, you know, a few people are having that side effect in the intervention arm in uh, the trial published in the New England Journal for the Pfizer vaccine. Um, do, do you know if there's a, somebody's asked about that um, and whether people with facial palsy will be able to get it? Um, I, I think there's actually a lot of question just around, you know, if people have allergies and it's safe for pregnant women. Uh, and I, I guess I'm hearing a little bit from you, Jeff, that we probably don't have answers to all those questions, but, but maybe, I don't know if you, um, if, if you can share what you do know and uh, about what we know right now and what might be coming down the road to guide us. Yeah. Um, well, the easy answer is that um, it's not yet uh, approved for use in pregnant women uh, because the clinical trials uh, definitely excluded pregnant women. And so um, I'm hoping that they will do some trials specifically in pregnant women so that we can have an indication for use in, in pregnancy. Um, so right now, unfortunately, uh, pregnant women are, you know, excluded uh, from getting the vaccine. Um, you know, there was this, you know, earlier this week when the UK started uh, vaccinating, they had two uh, instances of NHS employees who developed uh, severe allergic reactions. That's all it says in the news article. So I'm not sure the nature of them. So they said that anyone with, you know, a history of uh, allergic reactions or al severe allergies are uh, excluded from getting the vaccine, at least in their program. 
I've not heard that, um, you know, I don't believe NASTY has issued that guidance or Health Canada has made that exclusion um, at this point in Canada. Uh, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. Um, and as for, you know, if you have a history of balanced policy, should you get these vaccines? I mean, I think that's a very good question. Um, I think, you know, there's, you know, maybe if you're being extra cautious, then you, you would say no and, um, you know, wait and see if there are more data coming out in the coming uh, weeks or months. Um, or if you're, you know, super gung ho about, you know, not getting COVID and getting this vaccine, then you can take a chance. I mean, at least, you know, Bell's palsy for most, most cases will resolve, um, you know, on, on, you know, eventually. Um, were there other aspects to that question? Yeah, that so, like, you know, they're just flying in these questions. So, um, yeah. you know, I think uh, just a couple of things. So one, um, Michelle Griever did ask, you know, and I think a lot of us have been experiencing this. We've been routinely emailing newsletters to patients during the pandemic. Patients are calling the practice to ask about the vaccine. Do you have best practices on what should be incorporated in the letter we'll be sending out next week or how we could best start to address vaccine hesitancy? So, and then Noah Ivers um, replied to Michelle Griever. And, and for those of you who don't know Noah, Noah is a uh, um, Canada Research Chair based at Women's College and a family doctor there, leads work on um, implementation science. And Noah is leading some efforts across the country um, to get healthcare providers ready to deliver the vaccine. Um, and so I know his team has been working on materials, materials that can help us to uh, deliver the vaccine, answer some of these very practical questions that you guys have, but also help us to communicate with our patients. So he wrote in, uh, wrote in that, that they are preparing that. So uh, just stay tuned and um, hopefully we will have Noah come on on a future session. Um, Jeff, one thing, so maybe I'll, I'll turn it to you and others on the talk call to just speak a little bit about the issue of vaccine hesitancy. Um, I know, I think Lee, Trevor, or Liz, um, or David, you can also jump in as well, um, because uh, that, that is a question that has come up. How can we start to address that in our practice? Any takers on that one? Yeah, I mean, to me, I, um, you know, I think because supply is a bigger issue, I, I, I'm not super worried about vaccine hesitancy at this point. I think there are way more people who want to get the vaccine that we're going to have supply for, at least for the first, you know, three, four, five months at the minimum. Um, but I, you know, I do think we, you know, I think if we have good evidence of efficacy and, you know, we understand that it's, you know, reasonable safety profile uh, and we don't, we already know about the burden of disease from the, virus, um, I think most people will probably choose to get vaccinated um, because they don't want to be, you know, stuck at home and not being able to travel and, you know, you know, gather with friends and family. So uh, I think in Canada will be okay. I'm, I'm more worried about other countries. Like I saw a report this morning in the U.S. that only like 30 something people uh, or 30 something percent of people would be willing to get vaccinated. Um, you know, and I think there's a lot more vaccine hesitancy in the U.S. And, and hopefully, I, I know I'm not, you know, I'm not being naive in saying that there's no, you know, anti-vaxxers or vaccine hesitant people in Canada, but I, I think it's probably less of an issue in Canada. Yeah, and maybe, oh, sorry, and, on the, or, and I'll hand over to Trevor too, because of course this would be right in his um, work, but I, I do think um, the vaccine, I agree with Jeff, um, I, it may not be as high here um, as it is in other places, but uh, for sure the efforts that we're looking at in terms of communication strategy and educational materials will include um, issues of vaccine hesitancy for your patients. So I do think as physicians, we are leaders. And so I think starting that conversation now, because it may take people a while to move from hesitancy to readiness. Um, so I think everything that we can do to help with that. And actually, I think there is evidence that there's also hesitancy amongst physicians um, about the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to talk to each other. And that's what's so great about this opportunity to sort of ask these questions, because as physicians, we're very evidence driven. And so, um, you know, I think as more and more information comes in and we're, we're getting it in digestible ways like today, I think our own um, knowledge will increase and we can help each other to be um, you know, less hesitant. And that sort of surprised me, in fact, that there was, um, there is a significant proportion of physicians and healthcare workers who are themselves a bit hesitant too. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a so great point, tuned. Liz, that we need to lead by example, um, by starting to, by getting the vaccine in large numbers of healthcare workers. 
Um, and, and Trevor, I, I, I think you had taken off your uh, mute for a minute to, to speak as well. Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing. Um, there's vaccine hesitancy specifically to this vaccine, which um, has really surprised me, um, especially yeah. among healthcare workers. Um, but that might be because, you know, my bias is towards, uh, you know, I think we undervalue vaccines in so many areas of, 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 of life. And uh, uh, but there, you know, there are a lot of people, um, healthcare workers, not just physicians, but um, I'm really concerned about um, a loss of trust that's happened over the pandemic in some uh, sectors, such as uh, long-term care. And uh, for us to show up with the vaccine or not show up and tell them to go to a hospital to get vaccinated, I think we need to do a little bit more work um, to make sure that they're aware that, that, that you know, this is a privilege. This is a very uh, a safe and effective vaccine. And, and we're, we're excited about it uh, because the, I've, I'm hearing, to my surprise, that, you know, there are people who are rightfully suspicious that there are other motives for why, you know, long-term care workers would get vaccinated first. Um, so we really have to be aware of that. And I think leading by example is exactly um, it, it is the answer. We need to, to demonstrate that we're, um, uh, you know, we've read the science, we, we, we believe in the, in the studies and, the, and, and, and that we think it's safe. Thanks. Um, you know, so I think to your point around uh, prioritization, I think somebody did ask a question, you know, why, why are we not prioritizing Peel? Uh, my understanding, though, is that we, you know, we are priorit we are going to be prioritizing regions um, as well. So there's like populations of patients, but then there's also regions that will be prioritized. <coughs> I don't know if any of you could speak to that. Yeah, it's uh, part of the equity framework is to use is obviously to roll the vaccine out into gray and, and red regions first. Um, it also, you know, helps with this specific vaccine that it's it's quite difficult. So some of our more remote regions, um, it would be hard to roll this vaccine out anyway. And they're the ones typically that are not in the same levels of public safety, the public health measures. So the, the ethical framework, you're right, uh, Tara, is both a regional uh, and also by population, by yeah. traditional population. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, and just to remind people, like this is a te this is a test. Like there's a small number that we've been given to see can we sort this out. And mm -hmm. so, you know, as somebody just put in the chat, I can see that planning is underway in Peel. You can bet that they're um, going to move out from this, but we want to make sure. I think that okay, given the fragility of this vaccine, we can get it right so that the all the doses get into people's mm -hmm. arms and not um, somewhere else. Um, Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, you know, um, a lot of this moving forward is going to require really great collaboration between primary care and public health. And I think uh, a lot of us are thinking about our recent experience with flu vaccination and what can we learn from um, our efforts there. And I wonder, Trevor, if you could speak a little bit to it, the way that you have collaborated with family doctors in the Ottawa region. Um, around, you know, flu vaccination specifically, but also even more broadly than that. You're just on mute, Trevor, which has to happen. I knew, I knew, knew it. when it counted, it would happen. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. So um, we, um, yeah, we've had great experiences recently with our uh, universal influenza immunization campaign in Ottawa in terms of collaboration with uh, uh, family physicians. And it really, um, you know, it, it started out of mutual concern. We were being contacted by family doctors in the summer. And then, uh, you know, we were thinking about our own uh, clinics being threatened by, uh, you know, some of the COVID measures that we would need to take. And we had never really done this before where we did mass vaccination in the setting of, uh, of, of a pandemic, uh, except for the H1N1 experience, which was, which was quite a bit different because we didn't uh, have quite the same level of um, uh, of requirements around uh, uh, physical distancing and and PPE and so forth. Um, so yeah, I think when we started planning this in the summer, we were really looking forward to this moment, which was the the moment where we could take the lessons learned from that experience and and apply them to the COVID vaccination uh, a rollout. Um, so I just wanted to uh, provide a, 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 a overview of what we did uh, quickly. So basically. Um, healthcare providers, mostly family docs in the community said what they needed most of all was physical space to do this because their offices were uh, 
uh, too small to do the IPAC and uh, distancing requirements for lineups and other things like that. Um, so we basically use the city uh, resources and our own resources to leverage a larger spaces, community centers, uh, libraries, um, and our own uh, office, public health office uh, to do this. And um, we made an agreement where we said essentially that we as public health are gonna do all of the things like the screening according to protocols. We know the PPE standards, we know the flow through, we have that from H1N1, we'll, we'll, we'll organize all that. And then you come as the immunizers and, um, and do the documentation and uh, bill uh, and, and we'll do it side by side, joint public health nurses and then uh, uh, physicians, uh, family doctors doing it uh, at the same time. Um, really wonderful reception to that idea. Uh, uh, people, people really took to it. And um, uh, we had uh, great cooperation from, from, from the providers. I was a little bit worried that uh, you know, there were, would be a lot of little tiny details that um, would come up as we went. Um, but uh, largely, I would say that the, the um, family doctors were very understanding and, and, and it worked quite, uh, uh, quite effectively. Um, in terms of uh, other little things, I mean, the, the, the healthcare providers, we, you know, we had them provide their own uh, materials. And that I think, you know, was a little bit of uh, issues that we in public health don't think about as much, which is the different practice models that uh, providers might be under and, you know, the costs that they're paying for different things. If we provided uh, uh, some materials to some people who participated in these clinics were effectively uh, subsidizing their, their um, uh, practice, whereas others who decided not to join uh, wouldn't get that benefit. So we had to be a little bit careful about making sure that the providers were aware of what you know, materials and everything they needed to do, and they would clean their own station, uh, PPE as well. Um, uh, and then you know, we just sort of had standards that you know, we didn't want uh, one person uh, having a very different PPE standard than everyone else. Uh, so, so they just met the standard that we had. I think really what made this possible was both public health and family doctors looking at uh, this issue from a population health lens. Um, and that's really the connection and the tie that's binding that, that, that we've developed that's wonderful in terms of the collaboration. So it came out a bit through um, Ontario health teams were involved in as Ottawa Public Health. And uh, similarly, uh, connections with a, a community of practice ac across our whole region. Uh, not just Ottawa, just outside a family uh, medicine community of practice that uh, Lee Donahue is, has been involved in and, and many other uh, physicians in our area, Liz as well. Um, and I, you know, I think our, our medical officer of health in Ottawa is very, you know, people ask why is Ottawa doing a lot of these things. Our medical officer of health really understands the importance of, of family doctors or both her parents are family doctors. Um, so she's really made it a priority for public health to leverage these uh, collaborations with the population health focus. Um, so we've really learned a lot of lessons that are just so valuable for this rollout. Um, and most of them are logistical, as you probably can imagine, flow through. Um, you know, we've, we've learned that family doctors can do things a lot quicker than <laughs> public health nurses, which many of you knew. Um, but, you know, there are certain protocols that we want to follow uh, and other things. So you know, trying to find a, a reasonable compromise that, and this was the first time we were doing it. So I think everyone was really forgiving of the, you know, we were trying to keep numbers slow. We didn't want to have big lineups or congregate groups of, of people uh, waiting at the door. Uh, but, you know, where the bottlenecks are, the screening and so forth, we're going to look at that. Uh, and also we're using it now for our um, school-based immunizations. The script has kind of flipped a little bit. Uh, we do school-based immunizations through public health and we can't go into schools. So we're now looking to the family physician community locally to help us um, in terms of uh, how, how we can address uh, that through immunizers uh, in, in the community, um, especially in our higher priority uh, areas of the most disadvantaged communities, which are also hard hit by uh, COVID. Um, so yeah, I think Lee is gonna talk a bit more about some of the logistical uh, lessons learned and some of the maybe challenges, but also some of the hopeful things that we've, we've learned from this. Yeah, thanks so much, Trevor. I mean, it's been really heartening to hear about the collaboration occurring in Ottawa um, between public health and primary care. 
Um, and, you know, there's comments in the chat that we, you know, wish public health would collaborate early with primary care on the COVID immunization. And I think some people are feeling, you know, left in the dark. And I, I think it's probably important to say it's at this point, it seems like even you as an associate medical officer of health probably have limited information about kind of what the distribution will be like from a public health unit perspective. Yeah, so as disappointing as it was uh, to see that the task force didn't have a family physician uh, primary care representative, um, things people may not know is there was no public health sector representative on that uh, group. So, so you know that is a that is a big question mark for many of us in the uh, in the public health physician and public health sector community. So, um, I think we're working with uh, healthcare providers and this. And, and locally, and 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 actually, you know, um, some of these things they're just oversights, and you know, I, we find um, when we we put the message out there, uh, this is what we need to do. There's often reception, so I, we're already hearing that you know there's there's talk about how to get public health and more involved, and I think that will um, lend to to the family uh, family doctors being more more involved in the rollout as well. Yeah. Thanks, Trevor. Maybe I'll turn it over to you, Lee. And Brian, are you able to pull up uh, Lee's slides? And Lee, it'd be great to kind of hear from you about some of the practicalities um, in terms of how you guys collaborated. And uh, I know you, you, you've you also been big on, on using a tool um, that made it easy for you guys to deliver vaccines. And uh, we'd love to hear more from you about that. Yeah, so um, thank you. And uh, thanks for inviting. I. Um... You know, for the topic of today, we were talking about changing the way we work, right? And when we look at what we're going to change, you need to know where you're at to start from. And uh, I think for everyone on the call, no matter what your profession is, um, if you're a healthcare uh, clinical provider or if you're an administrator, um, just grab a second in your mind now and think of where you are in relation to public health and in relation to getting things done with respect to immunizations. Um, we were hearing an awful lot in our region about the impossible task that was before us, because like most of you, we would have an um, immunization party in my office. We would have 45 people coming through easily to everyone who was immunizing. So there were a lot of people, people saw their friends who they hadn't seen for quite some time. However, COVID made that impossible. And so uh, what ended up happening was we already were building on some relationships that we had with all the public health units, but in particular with Ottawa Public Health. And it is a wonderful team. And I, I do think that that comes from history and uh, it comes from individuals, but it also comes from an approach. So for your reflection of where you were thinking, how come that's not happening in my neighborhood? Um, think of what are the things that are, that are doable and sometimes even using some examples to say, well, I heard in another place this was happening. So I wanted to present also a bit of a concrete thing for people. These slides are going to be available up on the decks that, that we've got on uh, the Department of Family and Community Medicine. So don't worry about what's there. Um, but I saw a huge problem, much like Dr. Arneson was talking about, which was operationalizing. How are we going to do this? Because it wasn't going to happen in my office as a big kitchen party. And um, looked at a few products that were there and then came upon Can Immunize. And they have a, a, an app, which is fantastic. So it's called clinical flow. And I'll go to the next, I'll have you go to the next slide if you could, Brian, please. So here's the problem. You already know this, we've been through this. It was complicated because we couldn't bring people in. Uh, COVID's there, we knew that. And you had to socially distance people and you had to make sure that they came on time for things, but not too early and not too late. And then what do you do about paper? Um, because again, it's one more thing that's a hassle. Manually entering, uh, an enormous amount of immunizations in a short period of time for what we get paid for is uh, hugely problematic. So we need a solution for that. And next slide. Thank you. So um, apps work, you know, it's quite fantastic. Um, so what if you had a digital tool that allowed you to do this, right? And it doesn't have to be for just flu, it could be for grade sevens and eights. Uh, it could be for uh, COVID vaccine. It can be for anything in which you're going to need to immunize a large number of people. And what do we want and what do patients want? Well, they want to be able to book it online. Um, we've got to screen them. Um, and actually, you want to screen them just before they come in to see you. So you've got to be able to do it in a timely way. You want to get consent because they need to consent. 
And then you've got to document it, you've got to store it, um, and you've got to educate people about it. And so the can immunize app is one type of way in which you can, you can do all of these things. It was quite fantastic working with Ottawa Public Health in our clinics because we had a natural experiment. Um, Ottawa Public Health was doing some things uh, digitally, but other things were being done on paper. And so side by side, table by table, we could see what happened. And Dr. Arneson also already mentioned that, you know, we learned that the family docs and the nurses at the clinic were doing things a bit quicker, um, but we had ongoing relationships with those patients, whereas the public health nurses were meeting them for the first time. Uh, so there is a difference on that. But in any way, we had a natural experiment to look at. And next slide, please. So people had to book an appointment. That's how you got started. How do you know that you need to book it? You need to put it up on a website or you need to tell your patients. Um, and it, it goes from there. And the next slide, please. After they've booked an appointment, they need to know when they're coming, who they're gonna see. We did a collaborative of the people in my clinic. Some people have family members that they wanna come so we could book between one to four people at any one interval. We had limits because we could only fit so many people into our, uh, we, we were in a public library, so we had limits as to there, but the app permitted that to happen. And people had to sign in. We used an OHIP because we were gonna bill for these. And next slide, please. After they've booked, they're gonna have to do a screening. You want it done fairly close to the time you're gonna see them as opposed to a couple of days or weeks before. And next slide. The consent is there, it was electronic. And next slide, please. And then they need to know that they've done what they thought they did. They need to know where they're going because they weren't coming to my office. I am curious to see how many of you thought that didn't work and how many landed at our office. We had great fun imagining which of our patients are gonna come to the office as opposed to coming to the library. It wasn't a lot, but it was fairly predictable. And they received a notification as to when it was and uh, they also receive information about um, uh, services that Can Immunize provides. And next slide, please. This is what it looked like. This is the library. There used to be books, um, but the books were removed. And um, you can see that the public health did this. It was wonderfully designed, lots of space in between. Um, people didn't sit too long in those chairs though because the flow was quite efficient. Um, I was the first off in our group, and so I did a picture for everybody else that was going to follow as to how I set up my workstation. Um, we did know which supplies public health would supply, which was vaccine, which was lovely, um, and the ones that we had to supply, and we figured out a flow. Um, public health nurses taught us how to do a vaccine wrap, which is that little brown thing that you see there just above my iPad. And next slide, please. And here's another photo to show. That's the wrap for storing our cold, our vaccines, a bit of a brief cold chain. Uh, we also brought our bubbles. Um, this was actually one of our largest dilemmas because we use bubbles in the office, but you have to blow the bubbles in the office. So we had to find an automated bubble blower. It played music, which was annoying, but the children liked it. And next slide, please. So again, people need to know if they've gotten it, they might need it for work. The app permitted them to do it. And it was highly satisfying to have immunized someone and to have them just be walking away from the station and to hear the ping, which was saying, you've got immunized and they have a record. It was fantastic. Next slide, please. Um, another project that was going on, actually, this is in Dr. Maga's uh, uh, office in Briere. Um, because from an occupational health perspective, they needed to immunize their healthcare workers and to prove that they had done it. And so there's another app for that as well. And other units um, in uh, Ontario had, had used this as well. And so those records could be shared with your employer. Um, and so for healthcare workers, that, that can be quite essential. Some of the stuff about COVID is saying you're gonna have to prove that you've been vaccinated as well. And so having a way to prove you've been immunized is there. And next slide. There we go. So um, I did want to have where people, and I don't get paid from Can Immunize. I've been a promoter of it for a longest time anyway. They've got wonderful information. Um, the Catherine at Can Immunize is the, uh, the lead there for uh, uh, the app. And she's very happy to hear from anybody that might be interested in this or adaptations. And 
why does all this matter to the topic at hand? Well, we're talking about collaborations, right? So this is, you know, we had an opportunity to collaborate with public health, then with a, a national organization on a digital solution um, and to collaborate with nurses that were providing vaccine in the same location. Um, Dr. Arneson hadn't mentioned, but one of the key parts of forming this um, uh, was to have a working group um, with volunteer doctors, including a pediatrician, um, to just help out to give our lens on how would this work. And uh, we'll continue to do that as we look at the grade sevens and eights in this region, and possibly if, if we're able to, to, to help out on COVID vaccines. So thank you very much. I did want to share this with you. Thanks so much, Lee. Um, you know, I think it's great to hear how you guys operationalize this um, on the ground uh, in Ottawa collaboration, and then also using an innovative tool um, to, to really um, be efficient with immunize, uh, immunizing at a, at a mass scale. Um, I think it should be mentioned, we don't know what tool will, there will be for um, uh, COVID-19 vaccination. Um, our understanding is that the government is procuring or has procured, you know, the stages are procuring a, a, a single record because I think that is uh, it's thought to be important. I also just want to acknowledge that there, you know, you guys have so many questions and it's been hard to keep up. Um, but I do want to just uh, thank our, pa our panelists. Um, there are 32 answered questions in the Q&A. So if you haven't had a chance to go into the answered portion of the Q&A, please do so because there's a good chance one of your questions have been answered. Um, I also wanted to say that we, um, you know, it's clear we, there's a hunger for more on practical on the ground information on the COVID vaccine. And uh, we will be organizing a, a COP session specifically on that. Um, and uh, I, I don't have any details on this time, but it's clear that we need to do that. So following this session, we will do that. We will also um, do a, a, a summary of some of the frequently answer, answered, asked and answered questions from the webinar. So if you missed that answer tab, uh, not to worry. Um, so, you know, there's only a few minutes left and I wonder, Trevor, I'm gonna turn it to you actually, because I, I know that you, you, there's a lot of questions kind of about logistics out there. And, and I think you've started to think through in Ottawa, some of the things like, um, you know, how will LTCs be vaccinated? And how will, what is the role that family doctors might start to be able to play around the COVID vaccine? I wonder if you could speak to those things. Sure, I think they, uh, I think the stages is really important. And, um, you know, a lot of people are hearing, you know, the headlines that uh, which is you know vaccines are coming to Ottawa next week uh, that you know is really just a very small amount of vaccine and and the decisions around that are very different uh, as you might guess uh, sort of political publicity stunt decisions might be made about these small first doses of vaccines that is going to change very much uh, based on uh, you know when we start getting into rolling with substantial numbers of the vaccines um, so that's where the sort of zones and things like that come into play um, and, I, and I anticipate that that will be the focus with the, you know, military uh, headed task force over the next little while, which, you know, addressing the most urgent uh, needs. Um, but then I think there's another stage coming that they've talked about, which is the, um, uh, which is the mass vaccination phase, um, which will start probably March, April. I mean, April is what they're saying, um, but it could be as early as March. And the logistics, I think we need to really get together as public health and uh, uh, family doctors. Um, and the alternative, I think, path that they're going down, and it's not an either or, is the, uh, is the pharmacy distribution. Um, and, uh, you know, I think if we're not really advocating um, about the importance of involving uh, uh, family doctors in primary care, there may be a focus on a, a pharmacy distribution. I think that might happen too early. I think we need vaccine uh, mass clinics uh, in April uh, to get as much of the population vaccinated through a model uh, similar to what we did through uh, a, a, the, uh, the um, influenza vaccine. I think family doctors are going to be critically important, especially too, as at that stage, we're going to be diving into more specific um, uh, risk factors and who's priority, prioritizing within priority groups. And we're going to need the information that family doctors can provide around uh, their patient population about who should be prioritized. Thanks, Trevor. Um, there's been a few questions um, about this, you know, 
Central so, so Lee, there's a few questions about the logistics of the Can Immunize app and the Q&A, and I don't know if you're able to type um, some of those answers, like, you know, how does it get to the EMR? Can you bill? Um, or if you wanted to speak to that really quickly. Yeah, I speak faster than I type. So, um, yeah, so we're working. It's a great question because the idea is that this should be end to end and it should be sort of doesn't matter what EMR you're using. Um, the, uh, the idea of getting it into the from the, the data is there. So it's a way to filter in. We've looked at using health report manager as one option, um, but the teams are developing in terms of looking at getting it into the EMR. Breaking into the immunization field on the EMR is a really interesting problem. Um, and it does require a fix. Um, uh, again, on knowing what that it was given, um, you can code into your EMR once you've got the data in, but it's really important to be able to break into the immunization field. Um, the billing can be done because it's a, your, your billing, your immunization uh, file um, can be done even as a, as a group bill or uh, from, from there. Um, uh, you don't have to wait for it to be put into the EMR to do it. So, but I really love that these questions are coming because these are the things that we need to have on any solution. And uh, if people have other ideas, um, please reach out to me. Um, I'd love to hear your ideas on it. Thanks, Lee. Um, David or Jeff or others, do you guys want to, do you have any insight or knowledge on kind of the database that's being developed or uh, there were some questions about that that I've seen? Jeff, I, I have some, do you have anything that you want to add? Or? Have to go oh, why, why do you, yeah why don't you go first david yeah so so to the best of my knowledge right now the idea is that uh for at least the initial rollout this is or, or in general this is a um clinic in a box as it were it'll be a standalone system to uh, register uh, patients and record their immunizations um the hospitals because we know that it's first going to these two hospitals these hospitals there's no integration with their um, uh, EMR or EHR, they're being told not to immunize, not to integrate it. Um, I'm not sure what the value of integrated into a hospital management system would be anyway. Um, what I'm uh, sort of pressing for right now is to get um, in the same way that we rapidly, the team in, at, at Ontario Health uh, deployed HRM notifications for COVID swabs in about uh, four weeks. Uh, I'm recommending that they do the same thing and that would be a way for us to know that our patients have gotten an immunization um, i don't think it really matters which immunization that the the clinic in a box has to monitor which immunization because they have to get the same one if there's a repeat shot um, and the my understanding is the system will remind them uh, to get their immunization but we as primary care providers should know that our patients have got the immunization i think that hrm is a, a good way to do that and hopefully we'll uh, get the rest of us uh, to sign up for HRM in the next couple of months, because that's the other thing. I'm not sure why many of us aren't signed up for HRM. Thanks, David. Yeah. Oh, I think that's a great suggestion uh, about HRM, David. Um, uh, what I do know is that they are actively working on this solution for capturing the immunization data. Um, I guess they have, what, uh, you know, 96 hours to figure it out um you know before they start vaccinating um but they are saying that you know there is a central repository that we, you know basically it's what's known as panorama um that doesn't already exist so that's like the database that it's going to eventually get into how the information is going to get into that database is, is is actively being developed um and so um you know from my perspective i've been told that the data will be coming to ics so that we can do studies and we'll be doing the post-marketing surveillance um, very actively looking to, uh, you know, measure uh, effectiveness and safety. Uh, I'm hoping on a near uh, real-time basis, but uh, we'll see if we're able to pull it off. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and thanks to you and David, who've just been nonstop answering questions in uh, Q&A. So again, if you haven't gone there, please do. Some of the things that um, they've talked about and people have, in the audience have also contributed, you know, there are lots of questions about who can and can't be immunized. I think somebody mentioned that the NACI and NAC is going to be releasing um, some guidance uh, uh, for, uh, very shortly. Noah Ivers and his team are going to be releasing some um, tools for family doctors specifically to help with communication and to help to know what to do. Um, there, I think that people ask about long-term safety and there is a, a, some of, we obviously don't have data on long-term safety. People asked about 
um, you know, whether uh, we have uh, how quickly um, uh, the vaccine takes hold. And I think as Jeff and David mentioned, really good to go to the New England Journal paper uh, to take a look at figure three there, which I think is uh, really interesting. Um, Liz, I'm going to ask you, I know we're just about at time, but I, I do think it would be reassuring to hear from, for people to hear, you know, about from the college perspective, what you guys are doing to um, raise the voice of family doctors and what people can expect uh, in the coming weeks from the OCFP. Yeah, so thank you, um, Tara, for that. And I think um, the message I would give is that we've absolutely um, heard loud and clear that we need common communication, timely communication, and we need people working together. So the OCFP um, with, um, you know, the help of, uh, we mentioned Noah Ivers, who's a family doctor who's on the call today, but um, with Noah and some of these players from across the province and professional associations from across the province, so like the SGFP, like AFTO are working together to make sure we can kind of give you one message that really, um, is what you need as family physicians, no matter what your practice type is. Um, and then the other side of that is us um, amplifying and working, um, amplifying the voice of family medicine and making sure, you know, we people know we're ready to play a significant role and then helping to figure out what that's going to look like. And I think Trevor and Lee talked about that, you know, it's not always straightforward if we're trying to do mass immunizations, if you're in a small clinic with you know, only one entrance. Um, so how do we, you know, how do we help create neighborhood or um, collaborative solutions with public health or with other practices? So those are the sort of tools that we're hoping um, educational information that we're going to get you tools, we're going to get to you advocacy that we're doing, um, and just to underline we're doing it with other associations so that we're all giving the same message. So reach out Thank to us if you have ideas. I really I know I've really appreciated the communications from the OCFP, including your message that came last night. So if you haven't seen Liz's message from the OCFP yesterday, please do check it out. It has some great information and links, including links to this upcoming um, Public Health Agency of Canada vaccine webinar. Um, so that's on Monday and Tuesday um, in English and French. And you can see the registration details uh, will send out a lot, uh, ha were sent out actually with Liz's communication yesterday. Uh, next slide. Um, also wanted to highlight the opportunity for folks to participate in um, a survey around what resources um, you might need uh, for delivering the vaccine. And so um, uh, uh, Leanne or Trish, if you can put those uh, links in the chat, that would be great. And then people have those links for the survey and the webinar. Next slide. Um, and then lastly, I think just wanted to remind folks that I think registration is open for the OCFP summit. Uh, next slide. And one uh, next slide after that, we just wanted to thank everyone for today. Um, I wanted to speak about our next planned session. So our next planned session was for uh, Friday, January 15th. Um, on that session, we'll be joined by uh, Trish Greenhall, who is a, a family doctor and a esteemed researcher in the UK. And she's gonna be talking to us about, you know, lessons from the UK, particularly around long COVID, but um, evidence-based medicine, et cetera. And, and more, um, and of course, they'll be ahead of us. They're ahead of us slightly when it comes to vaccine distribution. So hopefully, she'll have something to speak about from that perspective as well. And as I mentioned, it's really clear we need to organize another one specifically related to the vaccine. And so we'll get working on that. And stay tuned for more information. In the meantime, our webinar recordings are available on the DFCM um, website. Um, and the, uh, the link is um, there on the slide and it has been posted in the chat. Um, and uh, uh, we will be emailing you a certificate, uh, main pro certificate uh, shortly. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists, um, Lee, Trevor, Jeff, Liz, David Kaplan. Um, you guys did an amazing job. Um, handling so many questions. And thank you to all of you for being such engaged um, and stalwart family physicians, um, caring for your patients and wanting to do you know, the best we can. So uh, love that we are able to get together and support each other. Um, happy holidays to everybody. Um, we'll see you in the new year.